Oh my gosh. Personal chambers of the dictator Enver Hocha. The George W. Bush Bakery. Hi everyone, I'm in Albania. Fredo Rockwell here, standing on Skandabeg Square, right in the center of Tirana, the capital of Albania. Skandaberg Square is named after this fellow here over my shoulder, who is the national hero of Albania. For a time, he kept the Ottoman Turks from taking over the country in the 15th century until his death in 1468. Much more recently, Albania suffered a brutal communist dictatorship between the end of World War II and 1991 when it was overthrown. Most of the visible remnants from that time have been erased. It's very noticeable. You don't see many here. But there are still plenty of invisible remnants of Albania's communist past, which lie right at the heart of the current political system. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Albania's political system, how it works, and what I've been able to discover during my time here. We're going to take a tour around Tirana while we do this. I hope you enjoy it. Let's go. This is Albania's presidential palace, the official residence and office of the head of state. The current incumbent is Byram Bagai, who was elected just recently in July 2022. The president may sit on the top of the political totem pole in Albania, but he doesn't actually wield a huge amount of power. He officially appoints the prime minister, but just like the king of England does in the UK, uh, he basically appoints the person who has a majority in parliament. The president is not elected by the people, he's elected by a vote in parliament. And before he became president, the guy was the Albanian chief of staff, the head of the military here. As far as I know, he's not connected to any particular party, but of course it would have been the Socialist Party which put him forward and effectively put him into office. It's really the prime minister that holds most of the political power, so let's go see where he lives. This is the Kriya Ministria, the official office and residence of the Albanian Prime Minister. The current incumbent is Edi Rama, who leads the Socialist Party and has been in power since 2013, nearly a decade now. If you're familiar with other European parliamentary democracies, you probably have a pretty good idea of what a Prime Minister does. Basically, he appoints a council of other ministers and together they exercise executive authority in the country and the legitimacy they need to do this comes from the fact that the Prime Minister has the confidence of a majority of members of Parliament. To stay Prime Minister, you need to keep winning a majority in each election or avoid a coalition collapse or losing the confidence of the majority of MPs. So it can be a precarious situation, but as I said, Eddie Rama has been in power for nearly a decade now, so he must be doing something right. And presumably he'll stay in power until he decides not to run again or loses the confidence of members of parliament. So let's go check out where those guys work. The Albanian parliament, known in Albania as the Kavindi, and right there, uh, is a unicameral legislature. That means there's only one house. It's not like Canada with the Senate or the UK with the House of Lords. And apologies for being so far away, but there's a uh, security guard giving me dirty looks as I was filming closer. And I've been shooed away from a couple places, so I thought I'd just film out here to be a bit safer. The Kavendi has 140 members. 100 of them are directly elected, and 40 of them are chosen from party lists. So a system that is somewhat similar to the one used in Germany. The Socialist Party currently has 74 seats, which gives it an outright majority, something it's enjoyed since 2017. The opposition in the Kavendi is a coalition of parties called the Alliance for Change. It has 58 seats, but one party really dominates that coalition. That is the Democratic Party, which has 49 of those seats. Elections are held for the Kavendi every four years, and it has a speaker. The current speaker of the Albanian parliament is Lindita Nicola. So let's discuss those two main Albanian political parties. The first is the ruling Socialist Party, whose headquarters is right behind me here. Now, this might surprise you, but the Socialist Party of today was once the Labour Party of Albania, which was the Communist Party which brutally oppressed this country for nearly 50 years. It changed its name in 1991, the year the Communist regime collapsed, and elected a new leader, Fatos Nano. 
I think it's fair to say that Nano was a party insider during the communist regime. He had been a protege of Nejmiya Hoxha, the wife of Albania's notorious dictator Enver Hoxha, and she herself was quite a powerful political player. I'm not saying that the Socialist Party is a party full of communists today, far from it, but what I am pointing out is there was no clear break between the Communist Party, which oppressed this country for decades, and the Socialist Party, which rules it democratically today, which I find kind of weird. Since the fall of communism, the socialists have been elected to power twice. The first time between 1997 and 2001, and the second time in 2013, and they're still in power today. This is the headquarters of the second largest political party in Albania, the Democratic Party. And I apologize I'm not any closer, but there are security guards and lots of journalists with cameras there. So if something's going on, I'm pretty sure they're not going to be comfortable with some YouTuber rocking up and filming God knows what right in front of their office. The Democratic Party was founded in 1990, before the overthrow of the communist regime. And in fact, it was founded with the express purpose of overthrowing that regime. And it did play a part, I guess. Uh, it was founded by a group of political dissidents who had been persecuted. There were a lot of persecuted political dissidents during the communist regime. Thousands and thousands of people were arrested, imprisoned, and killed over the five decades that they were in power. So I mentioned that there were still some less than visible remnants of uh, Albania's communist past, in my opinion, and this is the main one I was thinking of. The main political fault line in Albanian politics between the Democrats and the Socialists really has its roots in those heady pre-1991 days. The Democrats have been in power twice, just like the Socialists. The first time was between 1991 and 1997, and the second time between 2005 and 2013. So let's talk some more about Enver Hoxha, the man who ruled Albania with an iron fist from 1944 until his death in 1985. This is his former residence right behind me. It's closed to the public. It's not open. It kind of just sits here, although uh, the garden does seem to be uh, very well maintained. During World War II, Hocha was a resistance fighter. He helped fight off the occupation forces of fascist Italy and Germany. Uh, but during his reign, he was an absolute monster. He used his secret police, the Sigimuri, to terrorize the population. And he made just about everything illegal, from Western music to religion to having a beard. He was responsible for thousands and thousands of deaths. And during his time in office, Albania cut ties with nearly every other communist regime in the world, from the Soviet Union to China, for being too liberal. When Enver Hoxha died in 1985, such was the cult of his personality that the state erected this really odd pyramid thing here over my shoulder to become the Enver Hoxha Museum. One thing I've not mentioned in this video so far is this is actually my second visit to Albania. I came here first in 1993, just two years after the overthrow of communism. And Tirana back then was a very, very different place. It's incredible how much has changed in, in these 30 years. But I do remember very vividly walking down this street and seeing the pyramid and a local man was giving me a tour and he would stop by these stone squares which dotted the street and he would say, that is where Marx's statue was and that is where Lenin's statue was. And that is where Stalin's statue was. They had removed all the statues of the great communists uh, from the boulevard. And today, there are not even any empty plinths showing. So Toronto has changed a huge amount. And as I said, most of the remnants of communism, which I remember seeing in 1993, are completely gone today. Maria, Maria. Thank you. Thank you. So when I first came to Albania, the countryside, when I would drive through it on a bus from town to town, was covered in bunkers, just like this one. I'd see dozens of them at a time, uh, all up along the hillside or along the roads. They seem to be absolutely everywhere. And one of the things I've noticed most since my uh, arrival in Albania a few days ago is I have yet to see any bunkers at all until now. And here's one. These were built in the 70s and 80s, 170,000 of them. Uh, they were built to protect Albania from a feared invasion from Greece or from Yugoslavia or from somewhere. Militarily, of course, they were quite useless. Uh, I'll show you what they look, in, look like inside. 
And we're about to find out just how impractical these bunkers were. So, oh my gosh, this is, okay, this is so cramped. Supposedly this was a space for two people. Um, you can see through the slit here, and this is a machine gun mount here. And uh, there's another one here. It's been covered with graffiti. I hate to think what's happened in this uh, bunker over the years, but clearly a lot has been going on here. But yeah, you can see how you'd be fairly well protected. The dome structure at the top would deflect bombs and guns and, well, fa reasonably well, better than most structures, but I can't stand up. <laughs> I'm having to bend my knees and hunch in order to keep from hitting my, my head on the top of this roof, and that would hurt. <laughs> um, so I can't imagine being holed up in here for more than a few minutes because it would just give me awful back pain. Um, I can't imagine trying to hold out against an enemy in such cramped conditions, especially with another person. I mean, it would have killed them to make this about a foot deeper. That would have made it all the difference. Anyway, back out into the open. Ugh. Ooh. <sighs> I mentioned that Enver Hoxha made religion illegal. Well, it certainly is flourishing today, at least in terms of buildings. This is the Catholic Cathedral. And just around the corner here is the Orthodox Cathedral. And right behind me is the Etem Bey Mosque, which is right here on Skandabeg Square. Uh, it's not a very big building, but it's exceedingly beautiful, and it is rightly revered as one of the most important and famous mosques in all of Albania. It was built in the late 1700s, and it was closed during Enver Hoxha's reign, of course, because all houses of worship were. According to the latest census results I could find, 58% of Albanians identify as Muslim, 10% as Catholic, and 6% as Orthodox. My impression, and it's something I've seen referred to by many other people, is that Albania is a very tolerant society when it comes to religion. And even though these three major faiths all have houses of worship right here in the center, clustered around the, the centers of power in Albania, uh, the government and the state are largely secular. Let's talk foreign policy. One of the most fascinating events in Albanian history, at least in terms of diplomacy, took place last month. I'm standing outside the Iranian embassy here in Toronto, which was closed by Prime Minister Edi Rama following revelations that Iranian-backed hackers had broken into key systems across Albania and basically engaged in cyber warfare. So anyway, the embassy here was shut in September. There's been no activity since, and as far as I can see, it's completely quiet inside. The People's Mujahideen of Iran, a group which fights to overthrow the clerics, which uh, rule over Iran, uh, was moved to Albania at the request of the American government. They relocated them from Iraq. And uh, so they settled here in Albania in 2016. The Iranians were not very happy about this, and this eventually led to them engaging in cyber warfare uh, to attack Albania. It didn't get a lot of attention because of the war in Ukraine, but my friend James Kerlinzi made an excellent video explaining this fairly complicated story. So the People's Mujahideen, also known as the MEK, have a base that's about 20 kilometers northwest of here uh, and um, sort of in the middle of the countryside. I did contact them and say, could I have a tour of your compound? And they said no, which was a shame because they invited Vice President Pence recently. I, I don't see why they couldn't have let me come. Next time I'm in Toronto. Uh, M.E.K., let me come and see you. So you might be wondering why the U.S. government would ask Albania to rehome a controversial group of Iranian dissidents. Well, they knew they could ask Albania because ever since the overthrow of communism, Albania has been a staunch U.S. ally. This relationship was especially strong during the administration of George W. Bush. President Bush helped spearhead the campaign to get Albania admitted to NATO. And another sign of this especially strong relationship was that President Bush actually came to Albania in 2007. He was the first ever American president to step foot on Albanian soil, and it was a big, big deal. Look, they, they actually named this street after him in central Tirana. I am in the Albanian town 
of Fusha Kruya, which uh, George Bush visited on the 10th of June, 2007. His visit is commemorated with this statue, which I think is absolutely am amazing. I mean, I'm not a big fan of Bush in lots of ways, but just to see a statue of him to me seems very surreal. He came here and gave a one minute speech in which he said how excited he was to meet business owners and entrepreneurs, which was the point of his visit to Fusha Korea. But it's uh, not just the statue which commemorates George Bush's brief visit to Fusha Korea. There also is behind me the bar, George W. Bush. But by far my favorite tribute to the 43rd president of the United States is the George W. Bush Bakery. It's, it's a pretty astounding place. Look at those pink donuts. That looks fantastic. On June 10th, 2007, U.S. President George W. Bush and his wife, Laura, visited this bakery. And there's a picture of him at the bakery with an American flag cake. Along with NATO, the other international organization, which is extremely important for Albania's foreign policy, is the European Union. I've seen EU flags pretty much everywhere I've gone in Albania. Albania is an official candidate for membership. That process has been stalled for many years, but finally began earlier this year. So although I'm sure it will take some time, it looks inevitable that Albania will eventually be admitted to the European Union. Visiting Albania again after nearly 30 years has been a fascinating experience. I've had just as much fun getting to know the Albanian people this time as I did last time, but I'm really struck by the differences. In 1993, the people of Albania were just emerging from 50 years of trauma. But today, this country is growing and vibrant, and it's a really exciting place to be. Thanks for watching. I really hope you enjoyed this political tour of Tirana, and I will see you guys in the next video. Thank you